this season on Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. Guys, buckle up. Oh my gosh. Look at all this activity that's happening. There's a UFO buried there. A UFO buried. When I saw this, my jaw just hit the table. There is something on this ranch that seems to be trying to communicate. I've caught one. I've caught a skinwalker here in this area. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, it just went. There's some kind of disturbance over here. It's going down. It looks like it's trying to fly through a force field. We cannot rule out a secret military base right there in those mountains. You sure you guys weren't bugged? We're already known. This is a situation in Intel that we call burn. This pisses me off. What it sounds like we need to do is uncover what's below the surface. The question is, how do we do that? Burn the hole! Oh! Whoa! All frequencies in the spectrum are being charged. That radiation is above 6,000. We're pegging out. Let me see what happens. Whoa. Yeah, that got a reaction. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. We absolutely want to follow up on this. If Bigelow would have found that, he would have stayed. Welcome back to Carl the Crusher. We have another special episode of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch behind the scenes. We have an exclusive guest. Uh, that I've been wanting to talk to for quite a long time. Finally got the opportunity to meet and talk to him over the phone the other day. Mr. Chris Bledsoe is uh, an author of a recent book, UFO of God. It's right. such an amazing book. I've, I've been listening to it on audio over the last week, and it's so highly validating and relatable to me and a lot of my experiences. And I find it fascinating that now uh, we've had similar experiences, you especially, and then have been involved with a lot of interesting people and organizations that have come to your doorstep to work with you. And now you've uh, published this book to tell your story. And now have also been featured, uh, like myself at Mount Wilson Ranch, on an episode of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. We're going to talk about all of that. But uh, welcome, Chris. It's such a pleasure to finally have you uh, and on the show and get to talk to you. Well, I'm really honored, Carl, to to be on your show with you. Um, it, it was it's a really big thing. I mean, I've been wanting to meet you as well, and uh, because uh, what you're doing is is what I've been envisioning doing for the last several years, and that's get out there and 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 get the data and and share it on YouTube. I pretty much had that um, on the back burner for quite some time now. And this is uh, something as an, an experiencer of the phenomena and a witness of what people might consider UFOs or orbs and different things. This is something for you personally is a shared experience as a family with multiple witnesses that has been an ongoing thing in a relationship with the phenomena. And again, I, I relate to it in my own unique way, I think, but I, I would love to give you the opportunity to maybe give you the chance to introduce some of uh, your story and how all of this started for you so people can understand where you're coming from. Okay. Um, well, not to get too deeply involved with it because it could take me um, a, a long time to tell it all, right? The book right. covers pretty much most of my life. Uh, from a young child and but it really uh and it all all that period of time played into what's happening now from a young person uh, but it all came to a uh a head in 2007 january 8th which is elvis presley's birthday by the way mm. I, I never can forget that um I was at the bottom of the my rope. I had uh, lost everything I had because of the uh, one one world trade center thing or nine one one when it all went down. I was a builder in Fayetteville, building about a hundred homes a year, and had seventy under construction, pretty close to thirty finished homes. And suddenly, uh, Fort Bragg, which is the town I live in, military town. Uh, just quit buying homes. It, it ended real quick. And so I started watching from that point uh, on till I ended up selling a business in 05, um, a, a slow motion train wreck. And 
But anyhow, I was I was out. Uh, four children, married, happily married. And now I'm faced with with losing everything and trying to figure out how to support my family. And I was sick, really, really sick. Had been sick for 17 and a half years with what started out as IBS and ended up into Crohn's. And uh, I was a miserable human. And, and I was calling out there to God, whoever's up there. I mean, please, I was desperate. And uh, suddenly, and I was with my son and three other guys. We were, they were fishing on the Cape Fear River. And, and uh, I wasn't. I was just into, uh, I didn't let them know what I was thinking, but I wasn't a very happy human. And long story short, these three giant balls of fire, uh, orbs, that's what I called them then, um, came out of the sky. One of them, and they, they were hovering in front of me about 300 yards away across the field. And one took me, came and took me for four, and a, four hours brought me back and um that started uh, what i thought was the greatest thing that ever happened to me uh I, I, you know crying out to the heavens and something comes and now i'm no longer sick uh, my i've never taken another bit of medicine from that point forward and i lived on it for 17 years hmm. and uh suddenly the community didn't like what I was saying. They immediately they were wanting to bring holy water to my house and told me I was dealing with demons and so that's how it all started. And um, NASA came knocking on my door within a few months and um, asked me to not talk about it publicly. That if I didn't, uh, they would work with me and let me in on some secrets, but they didn't want me tainting my experience by going out to ufo events and getting involved with that community because they said people out there tend to take on each other's experience they see a light fly by and suddenly they're dealing with the galactic federation or something <laughs> right so, right that happens so, uh, my friend yeah. chris bartell and i we nicknamed that skinwalker fever yeah every twig snap is a werewolf and every satellite in the sky is a ufo and it's just yeah. Yeah. can't be like that you have to have a clear head you know yeah so um i did that i i didn't I, I did very little public appearance over the last 17 years 16 and a half but i've been working with uh, government officials and the academic world for all that time and i uh, still am in fact uh jim simi van from cia wrote the board in my book and he made the statement that uh, this case is the most studied case in history by government or non-government or academics. And so, yeah, that's how it all started. And uh, it definitely seems like you, after some of your experiences and as it culminated into full blown contact experiences and, yeah. and sort of visions and, and things like that, as well as multiple witnesses, like there was all sorts of different officials and secret groups and people that showed up to talk to you. I would love to go back for just a moment to the to the three balls of light. Uh, some of these stories that you share in your book when I was listening to it are relatable to me because that's more what I have seen is like balls of white light or red light uh, turning on and off and then just unnatural movement behind them. And then also, like uh, you mentioned in the book, encountering entities with glowing eyes, which is also something that I've experienced as well. But with the uh, with the three orbs of light, maybe we could go into a little bit more detail. I've been want, dying to ask you some of this. Sure. What, what was it like to be taken? I know that these are difficult experiences to describe. But when you say that it came and took you, did it feel like it took your consciousness like an out of out of body thing, like a near death experience, or do you feel like it was a you were physically carried up onto a, a craft? Maybe you can describe some of that. Well, I, I was definitely physically taken. Um, when I walked away from the group, they were it was ten after five in the afternoon, January. It gets dark 
you know, the sun's already set by that time. Still light in the sky. But when I walked away, I only walked a quarter of a mile away from where they were fishing. They were down in a river bottom. So I had to go about a quarter mile um, up to the field out of that bottom. And when I got up near the gate uh, to where I could see, there was what I thought was the setting sun. It looked just like the sun um, when I could barely see the top of it. I thought, well, that's the sun. So I'm looking down as I'm making a step because it's muddy and it's dark around my feet. Can't hardly see the ground good, but the sky still had a glow to it. And when I took two or three more steps up, I could see more of what uh, I thought was the sun. That color, when you can look at it, don't hurt your eyes late in the evening. To realize there are two of them there, and they're side by side. They're about 300 yards away and probably 50 feet in diameter, each mm. one. Um, and there, were, there, were, uh, there was fire, like fire swirling around and around these things. And you could see the flames just shooting off, like little tips of fire just you know, evaporating as it left this thing going around, swirling really fast. And so seeing that in the broad daylight that close sent a, a shockwave through me like a reality change instantly. Oh, my yeah. God, what is this? Um, you know, I'm commercial rated pilot, so I'm very keen at observing aircraft and uh, I knew immediately, without any doubt, it wasn't anything known. Um, I was so afraid, but yet so uh, marveled by it. I actually got down on my knees and used the hill in front of me to hide myself. I'd pop up just my eyes and I could see them. Hmm. And I was contemplating, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? Well, uh, I don't, you know, I, just all this went through my head. And finally, the fear set in so deeply, I began to think about my son. He's back down on the river fishing with these three guys, and he's only 17, and I was worried about him. And so I went through all this trying to figure out, rectify what I'm looking at. You know, this is not from this world. And when I decided to run, I made the conscious decision in my thoughts, I'm going to run. I've got to go down the hill. But curiosity got me. So I made the plan to stand up and run. I started turning my body, but I had to look back one more time. Mm. And so as I'm making the motion to run, I look back over my shoulder. And the second I did, up above me and out in front where I could still see these two, but a third one just appeared out of nowhere. Come just appeared. There it is. And it within a second, it shot down beside the the other two. Now there are three of them, less than 300 yards away, hovering just above the trees. Um, next thing I knew, uh, Carl, is I'm 50 feet from the fire, trotting up to the fire. And they're, they're standing there. The fire's all burnt down. We had a big stack of wood when I left. Um, and they're just three men standing there. And I didn't think about Junior. I was so excited to tell them what I'd seen. You guys won't believe what I just saw. And they're like, where in the, and I'm not going to use the words they use, have you been? I said, well, I was just up at the field. What do you mean, where have I been? I'm, I've only been gone 20 minutes. No, you've been gone all night. We've been looking you all night. And I noticed at that moment, Chris Junior was missing. And I asked them, I said, where's Junior? Where is he at? They said, well, he went in the back of the cul-de-sac, which is an acre dead end. You get dead end down that road in a lot of like an acre grassy area where people would camp and sit on the riverbank. Well, he'd gone in the woods behind the cul-de-sac on foot looking for me two hours earlier. And they couldn't find him, nor could they find me. And so I panicked and I took off after him. And when I found him, he was hiding up under these real thick shrubs, which the, air, the, the perimeter of that grassy acre is real thick. It's like real thick shrubs. You got to pull yourself 
to get into the woods. And once you get in there, the woods open up because the lights, you know, filtered from the ground. But those edges around North Carolina, the edges of the fields are always thick. And so he's hiding under this stuff. And um, he, he wouldn't shout. Uh, I'd call him and he wouldn't answer. Uh, he, he, when I finally almost stepped on him, he stood up and he's starting to break down. He's panicked and, and he's crying and he's like, where have you been, Daddy? Where have you been? I said, I, what do you mean? I was just up at the field, son. No, Daddy, you've been gone all night. Why did you leave me? I said, I didn't leave you, son. I've just been gone 20 minutes. He said, these creatures, these creatures were uh, scared me. They were they were within a few feet of me, and I couldn't scream. I couldn't move, and I couldn't. So he was in shock, and I led him back to the fire where they were fishing. Uh, well, they were no longer fishing. They were standing around it, and uh, realized that four hours had gone by. I had no clue that 20 minutes had gone, and it took me... Uh, a long time after uh, I was regressed by a Harvard trained psychologist, Dr. Michael O'Connell, uh, he said, I, I couldn't think. If I tried to remember, my, I would have a headache so bad it would just shut me down. I'd want to go to sleep. And so it was hard to, to, that was the hardest thing I ever had in my life to get over is trying to remember those four hours. And I remember some of it. I know that this third one uh, that appeared above me knew I was going to run. It let me know that I was going to run. It, what it let me know, the worst, uh, I guess the most shocking thing was, is to know that I was just seen by whatever that was. And it reacted to me. It knew I was going to leave. I knew it without a doubt. That feeling of being on its radar knowing that this mighty power, whatever it is, uh, was watching me, uh, that changed my whole way of life forever. Mm. And um, that's one of the hardest things to, you know, to see a light fly by in the sky, that's, that's a big deal, you know, to see it. But when it's interacting with you and, and, and it sees you and you know it does, yeah. that's a whole new world. It's unlike anything that I've ever, and, and to this, this day, I still interact with it on a scale of a thousand times more than it ever has been. It's exponentially increased. Mm. That's why the government's been here and these scientists, because it um, it comes most every night that I go outside, or even in the day if I search for it. Really? Yeah. So this yeah. is like an ongoing relationship ever since this first encounter and incident then. Yeah. It's never quit. And we film it. Um, in fact, you know, the History Channel was here and we filmed so many orbs, it blew them all away. It, they turned the camera to the crew and said, guys, what do you think? And they were like, oh, my God. You know, these are the guys with the cameras on and their eyes are this big and they're like, we've never seen anything like this. Uh, there were 35 orbs one afternoon up here and their AI machines detected them all as truly unknown. This is the, the AI scanning Skywatch machines that they have there caught yeah. all of that, huh? Yeah, they caught this, 35 unknowns on one machine oh or two God. machines in one afternoon. Now I've... I've heard that they're still actually working on some of the episode. By the time people watch us do this interview, it's going to probably come out on the same day as your episode airs on the History Channel for people to go watch. And I'm not sure how much you're even allowed to talk about the episode, but you're saying that they they filmed a bunch of orbs and saw all kinds of things. And that, that must be really validating because I know you've you've invited other people to come to your property and to even film and haven't always had the best experience, but it sounds like uh, similar to mine, it was really refreshing to work with the team from the History Channel, and I felt like they did a, a very genuine job. Was that your impression? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't say enough good stuff about, uh, you know, David and his whole crew. They were yeah. wonderful people. Uh, they treated his family special. 
and uh, they were here for seven days and we had a marvelous time and every night we had uh, action every night that's and incredible one of the things that got them is is i would tell them okay be here at six be here before 6 30 because that's when it's going to appear uh, so it got to be funny every day they'd ask me okay so what time today i said one day i said uh the last the fifth day i said i think uh be here at 601 six o'clock that's when it's going to show up still daylight right and so we all go out and there it appears at 601 exactly where i told them beside jupiter it's going to appear by side jupiter at six o'clock wow and, and i told them this two hours early and they're like how do you do that i said well i hear them they tell me it, it's in my head i don't understand it at all does it come through like a, I mean, some people would call it like a, a telepathy or almost like a download or just a deeper wisdom or knowing that, that comes to you. Maybe you can describe how that intuition comes. Well, let's just say you and I are talking right now and we're into this conversation. Um, but I've already planning on maybe this afternoon. So I've already in, had my mind on the tonight that we're going to have people over and we're going to have a sky watch. Right. But it comes like when I'm talking to you about something totally different, although I know my plans for this evening, you know, usually I have to have the plan ahead of time. Mm. Um, that way my brain is, is uh, somewhat focused on that, but uh, it can happen right while we're conversating to where, um, really drawn away from our conversation and, and these images come about this afternoon i see the numbers i see the whole thing play out it's like they they send it in images to my brain and i've learned to recognize that hmm. uh, no matter what's happening i could be watching the news and suddenly it, it this whole vision will come right in and i, I pay attention to that Almost That's, like, like you're, you're tuned into one station on the, on the TV, your first person point of view, what you're doing day to day. Right. And then an interference signal sort of comes in and, or maybe not interference, but it augments in and you receive these impressions, yep. begin to see glimpses. But this is also seems like it's in a relationship with your almost manifestation or as you start to visualize and, and and anticipate what's about to come, there's an interface or a relationship that seems to occur where you sort of meet in the middle and it arrives at the same time. I think that's really fascinating that the impressions are sort of building up to the moment of arrival and that uh, witnessing contact. That's very familiar to my experiences as well. Amazing. Yeah, yeah it's just, I believe it's telepathy. You know, everybody asks me, how do you do this? Well, uh, you know, I just say a prayer. Um, a good friend of mine, Jeff Kripal, he calls it telepathy through prayer. Right. Mm. So, um, or is that's the only way I can describe it. It's like a meditation for some or a prayer to me. Mm. Of course, I don't pray to them. Uh, I just pray to whoever's out there. You know? Right. Um, is this something that you had to develop, Chris? Because it seems like from the first encounter, it's almost just like uh, you're trying to run away from these objects. And, and I kind of want to ask you more questions about what they look like and things, too. But as you're trying to escape, it's just like there's a, a blank or a, a gap in time where suddenly you find yourself walking back to the campfire. And then you've had other interactions and encounters and had to figure it out. It seems like now you've developed an ongoing understanding and relationship where it's sort of uh, helped you develop the eyes to see and the ears to hear it all and to adjust to that signal and, and be okay with it. But it feels like it was a rough start in the beginning and a little bit scary at, at moments. Well, you know what the crazy thing was, Carl? And if you read the book, uh, for the readers, you'll see that I was the most excited human on earth that I met something from above that came when I was crying out and took care of my disease. But all of a sudden I'm, I'm uh, 
riddled with uh, it was almost like hate to me the 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 right. church and the community and they made fun of my children and of my family and it ostracized all my children with because they were seeing it with me they never quit it started when I left that river and came home within days my whole family was seeing it in the house these shadowy beings with a, a flash an orb would appear poof in a flash and out steps these beings i actually had that on video of a being coming from an orb yeah within five feet of me in a flash and out steps this tall white figure well, we would see him in the house and uh, it was a really a, a scary time but i was not afraid of it i wasn't any bit afraid because I knew why they came. Hmm. I knew they came because I was suffering and crying out. I was ready to shoot myself, but I didn't want to. You know, I was, those are the worst thoughts anybody could have. I, I was that low in life. And um, there's so much more to that, and the book explains it. But what it did, it drove us into isolation for the longest time. And I couldn't speak. I was dealing with CIA and NSA and DOD and uh, um, NASA and all these different groups. And I wanted to tell the community, look, if you people only knew who's interested, you're all making fun of me. But, you know, here's here's the head of the CIA at my house or one of the top, highest guys up there. But I couldn't tell it. So, um it kept us in isolation for years, and um, finally the government started talking more about it, and the, the public has been more accepting to it, and it was time for me to write this book, Yeah, and I did, and that has changed everything for this whole family. It's, it's been a pretty big vindication thing for us. Good. And, uh, that's incredible, Chris. I think the the misunderstandings around it all, and I would even say like the prejudice applied to the phenomena and the encounters with these entities or, or the craft or whatever, um, I think they're so misunderstood because often like you described, they comes as almost like a ball of fire, ball of plasma, and, and almost a scary encounter we don't fathom. The entities come out like a like a shadow figure or beings with red glowing eyes. And immediately we're stigmatized against that. Like you said, because organized religion, a lot of times cast that immediately under the rug of saying it's all just demons or evil spirits. And I was sort of raised to believe that if I was experiencing these things, if shadow figures were appearing in my bedroom or outside my window, and if I was having, you know, I would have missing time experiences where I would wake up in my bed, paralyzed in my bed, and there'd be an entity or someone standing next to the bed. And then suddenly I'd be out on my balcony, locked out of the house. Yeah. And I'd have this vague memory of like, I was flying through space or something strange yeah. in this neon light room or something. And over the years, I've had to try and resolve that. But I was always made to feel like those things were happening to me because I was doing something wrong and attracting this sort of evil entities to come and torment me or whatever. So it was a difficult struggle for me, but maybe you can describe what you, what you saw as far as what the, these beings looked like and your relationship with them to help resolve some of those concerns of people out there are having similar experiences as well. Well, you know, early on uh, in 07 is when I had an experience that same night when we left the river, it didn't end. Uh, the book explains this and there's a documentary that we did way back then in 08 that that i tell the uh description of what what i saw and, and exactly the same thing chris jr experienced but they were about three feet tall three and a half feet tall a little tiny like a a, a four-year-old child size what i saw didn't have these big almond shaped eyes it had um round circular what looked to me like um, some kind of device mechanical device over their eyes uh, that were glowing bright red uh, it it was glowing about the color of the moon that soft white glow had a triangle on its chest right here 
Um, and I have to say this, uh, that, and, and the red eyes, that, that automatically, you're playing with the devil, you're playing with demons, right? Well, I've since found out by dealing with a, a, a lot of biblical scholars. There's a scripture in Daniel, chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, and it's Daniel's description of an angel. Well, I described it on the documentary on Discovery Channel 15 years ago that it was glowing. It had red eyes and the body covering looked like it had glass. It was a shiniest, glassy appearance around its body with these red eyes. It was only four feet from me. Hmm. Well, the book, uh, Daniel says that without you know what was it he saw he described it as an angel what was it i think it's the same thing you and i experiencing we don't understand what it is you know uh but his description was it had red glowing eyes like fire and the body was so shiny it gleamed like topaz this is straight out of the bible but yet these same people were persecuting me to this day you're yeah. playing with the devil well here's your description in the bible of daniel's angel so there's so much confusion out there. Um, we're just at the, we're like babies taking steps, uh, trying to figure out what it all means. And, right. Yeah. So fascinating. Yeah. The way that you described, they had the triangle on their chest. It, was that like a part of a, a, maybe a suit or was that just right on their body? Was there clothing or anything like that? Were they carrying any devices? I couldn't see any device, uh, any, uh, it was really hard to see clothing because of the way it was glowing and the gleam from it. But I could see a darker shade underneath right here that resembled a triangle. And by drawing that in 07 and sharing that with uh, the public, which that got the attention of NASA in a big way. Right. And, um, I've since been given some gifts from them, from NASA, friends there, that uh, one is a pen that has that same triangle on it. Really? 24 karat gold, yeah. So they were real interested in it. Uh, they, the, 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 the man, I write about him in the book, told me that they believed it was the symbol of the universal creation of life. So I can kind of leave that at that point. But wow. Yeah. The, we got a lot to learn, Carl. We don't know. It is really hard to fathom because it, it crosses those cultural expectations that we're brought up to put all these different phenomena into separate boxes, like from the a shadow figure to an orb of light to a UFO to a, a, a spiritual vision and encounter. People traditionally want to separate all that out into different categories and separate phenomena. But just like your experience and a lot of what I think the entire show of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch is helping people realize is that these things are all interrelated in some sort of a way. Yeah. And with every encounter that comes across and through personally as a spiritual experience, there's all the same nuances that someone else might look at and classify as Oh, you were abducted by aliens or you were being uh, tormented by demons. And so everyone has these different mindsets when they hear these accounts and stories and they want to put it in that box. And I think it's a, a really refreshing that you're so open to share all of the details so that people can see that they don't have to necessarily be put into separate boxes and divided out. But these things are... Um, more uh, phenomenal or interesting than we can really fathom. It. And these categories are interconnected. And even though we don't understand them, that seems to be the case over and over again. And uh, so I'm kind of interested when these entities start showing up with your family, who was the first people that sort of came around interested? And, and did you reach out to people? I remember in the book, you reached out to like MUFON, is that kind of where that all started, where people got interested in you and your accounts? Yeah, um, it, it happened in January, and because of I was a I was a 
a deacon in the Pentecostal Holiness Church for years. And so I was raised in that, that uh, the Bible Belt. I was raised all my life to, to be a part of that and loved it. But um, it, it was NASA that came. I didn't reach out to anyone there. I, I reached out to MUFON in October, which was 10 months after uh, I, re I came on talking about it. And, and the reason it took so long is I was under duress. I was, I was being told that uh, you're not allowed to talk about this. The people from the church were sprinkling holy water on my flowers in my yard and the perimeter and they were out you know when I'd leave here they'd come thinking they were saving me from Satan right and um, it turned me against the whole crowd because they wouldn't listen to me what I wanted to say I was just completely written off so I felt like if I told it um, I would lose my wife and my family because they were putting so much pressure on her Mm. And the kids, oh, my God, you can't. Those kids don't need to be around him. This is what I was dealing with, right, outside interference. And I'm crying out the whole time, why? Uh, it, within five years, I was ready to give up because my, you know, my children were persecuted so bad. And that was because I reported it to MUFON in October of 2007, 10 months later. Within a day, they wrote me back, begging to come, and I told them no. Finally, in February of 2008, I agreed to let them come because I couldn't deal with it anymore. I had to talk about this. And when they come, within two weeks, they talked me into doing a documentary. Oh, you're going to be vindicated. you got to do this documentary. And they created that whole thing around this case. And they made me out to look like a liar. Uh, they did everything they could to debunk this thing. And they screwed up bad. They know they did now because they didn't think it would ever come back. But they were sadly mistaken because it, it never stopped. In its own did that almost life. feel like maybe an agenda? Because that was during a phase of your interaction with the phenomena where they weren't giving you pins with triangles at that time. Right. And inviting you to come and see stuff at the time they when this was going on in the beginning, they were telling you to stop and telling you to stop yeah. talking about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so they did their documentary by June. They came in February, I think by June, it was completely filmed. And uh, I was told all year you're going to be uh, and, and I was told I'd have some creative control where I could review the whole thing. Well, sadly, I got nothing but a big smack in the face mm. and they walked away and never called me back. They didn't want to talk to me anymore. The case is closed. I had people from all over the community came pouring out. We saw it that night. So I'd call them. Look, I have eight people here that want to tell what they saw uh, to vindicate me. Well, we're done with your case. And so that was my experience there. But that documentary came to the attention of some scientists at NASA. And um, by the fall of 08, there was this six foot four guy standing at my door knocking. My son answered it and he said, I'm Hal Pavenmeyer. He pulled out his NASA badge. He said, I'm from NASA. I come to talk to your dad. And Ryan called me, dad, there's this giant of a man. He was just 13, right? Standing at the door and we were terrified of government. Because MUFON's crowd had completely, it was the men in black days back then. They were playing, you know, men in black was on television. And, oh, they'll kill you. They, the government's going to kill you. They kept telling us that. And so uh, imagine that first time when this man standing at my door, we were all terrified. And we couldn't have been more wrong because it were these people uh, and many more within the government that, came and helped my family make sense of it and studied with us and still to this day uh, mm. study with us. And what I'm really curious, what did the, uh, what approach or tools or advice did they give you to start understanding, to deal with it? Did they give you any explanation as to what, what well, the phenomena is or where these entities come from? 
Well, I'll tell you, the first thing I heard was, um, uh, and I write about this in the book, is that uh, th this higher level individual from NASA came knocking on my door. Uh, he's, he's, he runs mission control or launch control in, in Florida. When he came, he's like, um, he's like Chris. He said, uh, and this was after we met one another, and I began to feel comfortable with the guy. And he, it's in the book about how I worked with him on stem cell research and all kinds of things that um, were, I, I wanted to shout to the rooftop. You know, you guys are calling me... Uh, you know, Satan, I'm playing with Satan, but yet I'm working with a NASA uh, friend to help save people's lives, you know, and I'd had no training in that. So my question was, why do you come here? Why do you need me? Why is NASA interested in this case? You guys have all the telescopes. You got all the rockets. You got all the money in the world. You got teams of people. You got eyes in the sky. Surely, you know about this stuff. And he's like, yeah, we see it. We've been seeing it a long time. But it has nothing at all to do with us. In fact, it's very elusive to us. But we know it likes you, and we want to know why. And if you would um, not get involved with all these UFO world groups and um uh, and work with us, we'll let you in on a few secrets. And um, but you can't talk about it. So that's how that came about. And he told me, he said, Chris, it's a lot like the Bible, where it is written, when more than one is gathered, there I'll be. And I can't tell you enough that um, if I got the right group around me, people that are not skeptical. Because first off, a skeptic will never see nothing. I can promise you that. If they come here and they're skeptic and negative, I can sort them out and find them usually and, and tell them. You know, you can go to another room where nobody's going to see this because you're disrupting it. But if we're all of like mind, it, there's, the phenomenon responds in a greater way uh, to more than one. It's our collective energy. We we can connect with them a lot better. Um, and he also said, watch the movie, The Adjustment Bureau. He said, there's a reason that movie was made. Um, and he told me, he said, uh, he said, on that movie, you'll see what we call the hammer. And he said, Chris, I work for the hammer. And the hammer works for God. That's in the book. What does that mean? I don't know, but I was told that I shared that, and there's a lot more there about this individual. And um, but yeah, this this is the kind of stuff that's coming from the government. They don't really know what it is. That's why they're they're uh, they're trying to figure it out. I, yeah. I think being conscience based, they have no clue. Right. Uh, and what people like you and I are doing the legwork for this, the History Channel and Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, it's all a learning thing. You know? it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, yeah. So the, the, the response was less like they're coming on spacecraft from another planet and more like it has to do with the gathering of people together in the right mindset. And there's a an effect in reality or a, a contact that's made through consciousness as, yeah, as consciousness. the gateway. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Some of them can appear physical or non-physical. I think they can appear any way they want. Honestly, these balls of light can look like a, a metal spear uh, in the daytime, a black ball, a shiny silver ball, or um, you will never see them. They're, they're translucent. And when they want to, they can, um, become a glowing white ball in the day it can mimic most anything uh, there's so much talk and speculation and i get questioned this all the time 
that the phenomena has to do with specific locations like the geology or the property or there's a, a interdimensional portal or gateway with the ley lines. What is your opinion on all that in, in relation to the phenomena compared to how much you feel like it's more of a personal interaction? Because it sounds to me like you were personally going through life trauma where you were at the end of your rope at a dead end and and looking for a way out. And there was sort of a, an intervention that occurred with the phenomena that came that way that's more personal. So I'm just curious what you think about your property and where it's at, if that amplifies things, or does the phenomena follow you as a personal relationship? Well, this is one thing that... Um without you know talking too much about the history channel thing but um i've heard that for for 15 years that it's about the land it's about a haunted location it's about you know this ranch or that ranch well i, I do believe there are uh, a lot of locations that uh, it, it kind of hangs around for whatever reason, maybe it's electromagnetic, uh, a magnet, some, I can't use the right words, but um, maybe it's a ley line. But in my case, it doesn't matter where I'm at. And this is what's got the government so involved is because they know wherever I go, it's with me. I was in Delaware over the Memorial Day with my friend Jim Simivan and his wife and their friends now, he lives down the street from joe biden right <laughs> and uh we filmed uh a dozen orbs over his house and some of them going right over biden's house i have them flashing us and jim's like what is that and i won't use the words he said i said that's what we're looking for jim that's that's it and we had some right above the trees it would fly by and disappear. And so it doesn't matter. I can be in Texas. I can be in California. Um, I can be, well, maybe you and I need to get together sometime and, and do a joint investigation. I, 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 I think it you. has to happen. I think yeah. either I need to come out to your place and meet your family, or you can come over to Mount Wilson ranch and hang out there and meet everybody or, yeah, Either one eat, would be, both maybe eat. we can do both How about that so i think so i think it would yeah. be an amazing thing especially if a lot of people watch the episodes of beyond skinwalker ranch the possibility of having future collaborations through the history channel to do a more ongoing season or a full established show of its own where we get to work together ongoing would be an amazing opportunity to would it be that would be incredible um i told i i told this for the last at least three or four years i've been planning to to create a youtube channel and rent a camper or buy a camper and go out into these places like the the serpent mounds in ohio mm -hmm. to mount wilson to uh, the especially utah i wrote about utah in my book how magical uh, of an experience I had with the lady and it was driven into me. It's Utah. And, um, and That's funny. right. Yeah. When you had the entire encounter with the, with the lady and that yeah. message that she conveyed and the environment that you were at, you felt like you were in a place Utah. like in Utah. Was it like the, the desert Southwest or was it more like Skinwalker mm -hmm. Ranch up North in the basin? No, it was in the desert and um, it was in something like Butler Wash Canyon. I have watched every show I can find for the last four or five years on Utah. My whole life is about, I even watch off-road recovery guys like Matt's off-road recovery. He's in Hurricane, Utah. He lives, and, I was just by his truck three days ago getting new tires on my, my pickup yeah. and his truck was there. Yeah. I've got to meet him, but I follow him because they take and they go through all the back country. They go through Zion National Park and yep. the Virgin River. What about all that? How so wait, that? that's right where I live. I live right here by Zion. The Virgin yeah. River is just down the road from me. All uh, that. Why don't you just come and hang out at my place and you can bring your a couple some of your family that's interested and we'll go find the spot. What if we what if we do the 
the meditations and the prayer and we do the the protocol and we we go find the spot where you met the lady and see what's there like what if uh, it's really there that's my plan and i think we could create a lot of uh we could film a lot of stuff i have no doubt we'd film a whole lot of stuff and and it's not limited to the air um uh, without giving it away the, on the History Channel, this last episode, you'll see me wearing a helmet. And there's a reason I have that helmet on. Uh, we write about that in the book where um, they were testing me at the Monroe Institute and two of their newest machines wouldn't work. Uh, my brain kept frying their machines for really? some reason. Yeah. And so they recreated that on the History Channel, and they got some of the most amazing stuff that could possibly blow everyone away completely. I love it. Uh, yeah. So they actually they hooked up uh, EEGs and sensors and everything to map your brain waves. This is something that I've done at Mount Wilson. We took a portable device with a laptop up into a indigenous cave system that we. Uh, uh, went to based on meditations and different experiences and things like that and uh, put a headset similar to that on me and my friend Chris Bartell who used to be a security guard at Skinwalker Ranch mm -hmm. and had an amazing encounter with a, a a vision of a Native American that basically used to live and dwell in the area that kind of watches over the place and pretty mm -hmm. remarkable but the same thing, kind of mapping the brainwaves. So for the episode, you got to actually do that on camera for the History Channel. That's amazing. Yeah, and I don't want to give it away, but let's just say that um, something appeared in front of my hand. I held my hand up, and I asked it to appear in the forest. Not up here. We filmed it all week there. I'm on it. I want you ground level. And let's just say from about 50 feet away, um they got some amazing footage at the same time they had a neuroscientist from new york there analyzing my brain and he was like oh my god i've never seen nothing like that so um that's amazing think, yeah so they so they're tracking your brain and getting on camera multiple witnesses and a and a doctor there doing it all yeah that, oh my gosh so that's yeah. i can't believe it so it sounds like your experience with the History Channel, all those guys, was was excellent, just like mine. I feel like they respected uh, the property and us and our story and everything that we had to say. I think it's inevitable, Chris, that we end up working together at some point, whether yeah. for the show or personally or for Beyond Skinwalker. I think it would be amazing to meet you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm down. I'm down. In fact, ever since I'm... Uh, met you and was introduced to your channel i'm like oh my god he's doing what i've been dreaming about doing <laughs> and i told david my manager i said david uh i've got to go to utah i have got to go why is utah in my book why am i so obsessed with utah and everybody even my voiceover artist for my audio book daniel is from utah um it's just it just keeps coming and all this happened after i wrote about it and so you said butler wash canyon maybe yeah is there yeah. a what do you, was there a sense of there being ancient carvings or artifacts around the petroglyphs has i i, I consume everything i can about the petroglyphs and the pictographs and the, my experience with the lady was if you look at Butler Wash, and that's just one of thousands of places out there, yeah. there's this ledges where they're up elevated off the ground, you know, yeah. above the bottom. They're under these ledges. And my experience with her was in a place that looks so similar to that, that um, I know that it's Utah. And that's why I wrote about it that way. In fact, the day that the book was released in February the 19th of this year, my son Ryan stopped at Zion National Park and took a picture for me for the book. And I posted it. The day of the release, I posted this Zion National Park on my YouTube. So I could walk out my back door onto my porch and the south end of the mesas of Zion National Park is what my view is. 
yeah. big 500 foot the the canaan flats is what they are right by up the road from hurricane uh oh. where that uh the off-road rescue guy is yeah i yeah, don't live we, right here you guys got to come well you guys yeah. heard it here first on the show <laughs> Chris Bledsoe and his friends are going to come here uh, to my neck of the woods, and we're going to go try to find uh, the place that you've seen and other experiences that you've had and interactions with the lady. And if anybody wants to read about that interaction and encounter with the with the lady and all these other stories that we've been talking about, you can get uh, Chris Bledsoe's book. I've got the link as my book of the month in my link tree in the description box down below of this video, UFO of God. The Extraordinary True Story of Chris Bledsoe. And I, it's just been incredible to talk to you. I think we need to have another interview and conversation again, get into some of these interesting characters that showed up because we didn't even talk about Colonel Alexander. I would love to go. We could talk for a ton about uh, the Monroe Institute and yeah. the same sort of protocol that I use is similar to the methods that they use as well. I think it's really um, fascinating. I would be honored, Carl. Absolutely. Anytime, shoot me a text and I'll be glad to come on. But yeah, there's a lot of other players like Dr. Alexander. He's in the first chapter, by the way, and he's later in the book. Uh, he's been a very special person to my family. He adores my children. He and I had an experience together. Um, and he writes about this uh, in Reality Denied, his new book. Uh, chapter two is about he and I and my daughter, Emily. Hmm. Uh, uh, we went down to the river. He wanted to go through the whole thing, and I showed him. But long story short, we were out uh, back from down at the bottom, standing against my car. He was leaning against the driver's side fender. I was at the driver's side door, you know, my arms crossed, looking up to the south. My daughter's sitting in the back seat with her legs hanging out in the door. And we we're all standing there. And the stars came out and uh, I suddenly heard nature. I, I'm very in tune with nature and I heard everything stop. Of course, John couldn't hear it because he has hearing aids, right? My daughter didn't hear it. She's talking to Victoria in the back seat while watching it. I looked over at John, my hair stood up and the vision came, this telepathic vision that we're here. I looked at John and I said, John, they're here right now. And within 10 seconds, it appeared. It didn't fly over. It appeared in front of us. Oof, this big ball of white light. And then it flashed like four or five times and then shot off to the south. And John's like, oh, my God. I mean, that changed his life. And yeah. I was honored to share that with him. And so imagine that. Uh, yeah. How much attention in Washington and different places that got. So. Yeah, when those uh, top officials show up and they come to investigate and then they witness it and encounter it for themselves, it's like, yeah, yeah now you're probably the focal point of a whole <laughs> bunch of interesting people. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I've had three U.S. senators at my house. Three. And I've been in conversation with more, you know, congressmen and stuff. So, um yeah, it's made a, it's, and I can't reveal who they are, right? right? But one wrote me the other day and said, I love you, brother. I love you. And he's an old time senator. And, and he brought his wife and children uh, and friends that one very sick individual that I mean, mm. keeping prayer. But yeah, these people are nice. They, they've been good to us. It's the government. Has it been uh, nasty and ugly and threatening? Not at all to us. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. That's yeah. been really good to hear that that experience, uh, your relationship with all of this has changed. It sounds like in the beginning you were going through the darkest period of your life. And now yeah. as you've come out with this and faced kind of the criticism and gone through it, even at, at, from the government and other officials now, it sounds like you've uh, found the right group of people and are finding your path through it and developing relationship. I think it's amazing. I've had some very interesting people message me and contact me and take interest in what I'm doing. You just never know uh, what we're really a part of and why I don't, I don't know that there's anything special 
with me or what it is. It just happens to be those circumstances that we go through that prime us for those moments of contact or those experiences that I still can't quite explain. But I think uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person, Chris, and sharing some of our personal stories and encounters, especially if you came here and we follow your intuition and, and some of that inspiration and go to this spot here in Utah and just see what happens. And and uh, I think I'm just the man to catch it all on camera for you, Chris. Well, I believe you will. In <laughs> fact, I know you will. Let's just say on my uh, on my cell phone, I have uh, I had to get a one terabyte hard drive on my cell phone because I have so many videos. And in the last uh, in the last 24 months, um, I have over 2,500 videos that I've taken uh, with my psionics. I have a psionics, a little night vision monocular, right? And I yeah. keep the, the app is on my phone, but there's right at 2,500 videos in the last two years. And um, that ain't counting the last 15 before that. Hmm. Or 14 and a half. So uh, th there's probably 15,000 photos and videos on my phone. And some of these are very close, you know, a few feet away. It, it, sometimes it'll appear right in front of me, right? It's just over my head, this hmm. fire. Often there'll be a yellow fire, like a flame. Uh, you know, just here it is. It's burning and then it goes out. But uh, may look like a candle inside of a little round orb this big be a candle inside a flame burn it's weird fascinating yeah is it is it ever like a physical craft that seems to be made of mechanisms or metallic or does it just mostly appear like these energy forms 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's uh energy it's a ball of light but i have several good videos in the daytime um uh, of these silvery, shiny, glowing uh, craft. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's all above my head. It's right. like I'm just a toddler trying to wade through, you know, chest deep water and don't know how to swim. So, well, it sounds like you're growing gills and you're finding a school to swim with. And that's yeah. really refreshing, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, Chris, I don't want to take any more of your uh, day today. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to talk to you and and to become a friend of, of yours and mine. It's just been really awesome. And we've been almost texting back and forth a little bit every day. And I really appreciate you. Uh, I cannot wait to meet you and work with you and have some experiences together. And uh, super stoked and excited to watch the new episode of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. So when everybody's done watching this video and this interview, make sure and go onto your local provider or whether you wherever you watch uh, the History Channel and check out Chris's episode with all this amazing footage where they hooked him up, uh, scanning his brain, watching everything happen with amazing encounters caught on camera uh, and you get to watch it. So make sure and go check that out and get Chris's book in the links down below. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Carl. And uh, this is just the beginning. So um, you feel free to call me or write me anytime. I would look forward to it. And uh, I'm already, my wheels are turning about Utah. You, you don't have to call me very hard, right? No. And this is what I do, Chris. I, I pursue this as my passion and my full-time career. And I do this and work from home. And I'm very close to selling my house, making one more move and being debt-free. So I have no concerns at all and just can do this really full time. So anytime you want to come, uh, you're welcome to come and join and we can do all kinds of cool stuff together. Yeah, let's do it. I appreciate you, Carl. I really do. And like I say, call me anytime. Thanks, Chris. All right. We'll catch you guys later and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. For years, scientists have been working to reveal the secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. But is it possible that the clues to unlock the mystery are located beyond the borders of this hub of high strangeness? Now, Whoa. an ex-CIA agent and a veteran journalist have been recruited by the Skinwalker team to go on a high-stakes mission across America. Look at all this activity that's happening. That's unbelievable. Oh my gosh, Whoa. look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. The goal 
uncover evidence that may finally expose the truth. What is that thing? It's getting more intense. You ever seen anything like this before? No. This is just the beginning.